So, um, before we start, uh, make sure to um, write your name on the, the lunch sheet, otherwise you're going to go without food. Message from the organizers. So, um, I'd also really like to uh, thank the program committee for inviting me and um, for the organizing committee for s organizing such a great, great event and facilitating my stay here. It's really an honor to be giving a keynote at a series that I really hold close to heart. Anyway, um, the talk proper. So before I start, I'd like to make a small proviso. As I've argued in a number of papers um, and in the uh, book itself, it makes little sense for any focused talk, I believe, on games to refer to games as a whole, as if there was this unified set of entities that we could make blanket statements about. The difference between various types of games can be so wide that any argument we try to make for one will invariably not apply to others. In this talk, I therefore will focus on games that take place within navigable virtual environments. That means that abstract games such as Sudoku, digital versions of card games such as poker, or board games like chess do not fall within the scope of, of this dis discussion. So I'm going to start with a little video and I'll... Okay, can I have someone describe to me what's on screen? Three. Three. Yeah. Someone else? So description of what you're seeing on, on screen. It's not a trick question. Yeah? Sniping soldiers. Okay. Yeah. So all these descriptions um, are correct. So. Any viewer of this video can describe the specific game, Battlefield 3, um, the particular action taking place, me running, um, the player throwing themselves on the floor, um, the objects in the game, like the sniper rifle or the building or the trees, whatever. A more game-savvy viewer that knows the game, at least, might comment on the more ludic aspects of the game, such as, um, well, this is a rush mode of this multiplayer version of Battlefield 3, there are two teams, um, the, uh, so we have attackers and defenders, there's an objective here that the attackers have to get to, plant a bomb, and the defenders have to get to it and defuse it um, uh, for them to, to, to not lose. The defenders win if this number over here, which starts at 100 and goes down to zero, uh, reaches zero. Every time an attacking uh, player is, is killed, they, uh, the attackers lose a ticket, one of these numbers. So, that's the, that's the uh, broad con you know, context of the game, and, and all of these statements are, are correct. However, they would not really describe what this video is to me, personally. Since I am the protagonist of this on-screen action, what this video shows is a memory of mine. It's something like a visual diary of an experience I had in a place. In this case, a simulated place. To me, the video has a completely different connotation than it does to you, the viewers. This memory is particularly significant because it has, attached to it, a sense of satisfaction at my managing to single-handedly turn around the thorny situation for my team. In this case, a team, these guys in green here, or friends of mine that are screaming over Skype in frustration uh, and getting constantly killed by the squad of snipers that we just saw and who were blocking us from getting to um, where our objectives are and basically without taking these guys out we're going to lose the game. 
And off I went and managed to, to pull this off so it has this sort of sense of satisfaction. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of bragging a bit. <laughs> I took like 70 videos before I could find a decent one. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll just let that, one second. I'll read that run again. What I see when I look at the screen is a reactivation of a memory I have of this engagement in Karakand. I am reminded of my heart thumping as I ran from building to building, expecting to be shot on the way. The anxiety of going from room to room behind enemy lines and getting kind of lost. Um, the exhilaration I felt when I saw the backs of the sniper squad we just saw. The joy soon turned into position, into tension when trying to stay calm and get my shots in accurately before the sniping team locates me. And when they do, the sense of panic I felt when I got hit and retreated instinctively into cover. All of these point to a sense of habitation of the game environment. In these moments, I am not playing a game from a critical distance, I am inhabiting an environment. The phenomenon of virtual environment habitation has been the cause of much debate and confusion, as pointed to earlier today. It is most often known by the labels immersion and presence. Both terms are used to describe the sense of being there, where there refers either to a virtual environment or a remotely um, located physical one. The two terms are often used interchangeably. Some theorists make a distinction between the two, but there is little agreement in the field of presence research about the meaning of either. Within the games world, be it games research, the games industry, or the general gaming population, immersion is the preferred term used. I will thus stick to immersion to refer to the phenomenon um, so that I don't have to say immersion dash presence every time. Although immersion is discussed frequently and widely, there is scarcely other term within game research that is shrouded in such vagueness and confusion. When we sit down and actually ask designers, players, or even game academics what they mean by immersion, the answer covers anything from the deeply engaging to the hopelessly addictive and many shades in between. So where does all this confusion arise from? In the years researching material for a book on the subject, shameless plug number one, I found that the vagueness around the terms stems from four main challenges to understanding the phenomenon. So I'm going to look at these four, this is just a summary that I made to try and sort of wade through this um, mess. The first challenge has its root, roots in a bit of a lexical model. Here, immersion in its media-specific sense of inhabiting a virtual environment is confused with its related sense of absorption into pretty much anything, any kind of activity, be it gardening, chopping carrots, um, whatever. This challenge is probably the most common source of confusion. A per perfect example of this can be found in Salem and Zimmerman's Rules of Play. Here they claim that immersion in its virtual environment habitation sense does not in fact exist. They call this the immersive fallacy. They back their argument by quoting Helena Gorfinkel, who states that the confusion in this conversation has emerged because representational strategies are conflated with the effect of immersion. Immersion itself is not tied to a replication of mimesis of reality. For example, one can get immersed in Tetris. Therefore, immersion into gameplay seems at least as important as immersion in a game's representational space. Now, this claim ignores the fact that virtual environments enable a form of experience that was not previously possible. Brenda Laurel and Janet Murray employed the metaphor of immersion to address this experiential gap. In their virtual environment-specific formulation, immersion refers to the sense of being completely surrounded by another reality, in this case, a virtual one. But since in the English language, immerse, immerse can also mean to be deeply engaged in, the two metaphors are often used interchangeably. Now, games are particularly involving, and in the case of some games, they also enable the sense of inhabiting an alternate environment. But these are not experiential equivalent. So it's easy to see how we can switch one metaphor for another, but it makes little sense to relegate a term which has accrued media-specific connotations to a prior, more general use as Salen and Zimmerman argue with their notion of the immersive fallacy. 
This challenge is particularly problematic since by using the same term to refer to two different experiential phenomena, theorists too often conclude that these terms are the same form of experience. The second challenge, also known as the book problem in presence research, results from stretching a metaphor to account to too many media forms. Within both presence research and game studies, it is common to discuss immersion in, in terms of both virtual environment and non-ergodic media such as film or literature. Douglas and Hergaden, for example, state that the reader paging through Balzac, Dickens, or for that matter, Judith Krantz, has entered into the same immersive state, enjoying the same high cognitive load as the runty kid firing fixedly away at Space Invaders. Similarly, Julian Cooklish argues that immersion is merely a technical term for what Samuel Taylor Coleridge has called the willing suspension of disbelief, which is a pleasure provided by literary texts as well. Book readers might imagine inhabiting the space described by a book, but that imagined world does not recognize their presence. Although this belief importantly highlights the role of imagination in perception, it ignores the difference between imagining doing something and actually performing that action in a simulated space. It's also worth noting that in the case of literature, there is one consciousness active in the imagined scene, that of the creator. In persistent virtual worlds, on the other hand, the presence of the player is acknowledged and reacted to both by computer-controlled agents and other human minds. The presence of other, others in the environment has a strong bearing of our sense of inhabiting it. The third challenge lies at the other end of the spectrum from the second, where the second challenge ignores media specificity and rests solely on the individual's imagination, the third claims that immersion is determined by the properties of technology. A bigger screen will, will obviously result in a more immersive experience. Surround sound is essentially more immersive than stereo sound and so on. And here's a, a good example from uh, Mel Slater. Suppose you shut your eyes and try out someone's quadraphonic sound system, which is playing some music. Wow, you say, that's just like being in a theater where the orchestra is playing. That statement is a sign of presence. You then go on to say, but the music is really uninteresting, and after a few moments, my mind started to drift and lost interest. The second statement has nothing to do with presence. You would not conclude, because the music is uninteresting, that you did not have the illusion of being in a theater listening to the orchestra. A virtual environment system can be highly presence-inducing, and yet have a really uninteresting, uninvolving content, just like real life. Slater assumes that fidelity creates an undeniable pull on the listener's consciousness, creating a sense of presence. This conception of media technologies marginalizes the key role that interpretation and agency play in creating a sense of immersion. Our prior experience, expectations, and knowledge are a crucial part of our interaction with the environment, virtual or otherwise. If you have never attended a classical musical concert, nor even seen a video of one, it's not clear that you'd, keep, you'd feel present in the way Slater describes, simply by turning on the sound system. Similarly, if you hear a genre of music which you're not familiar with, or which, for example, to you is noise and to me is, is music, I'm not going, you're not going to feel like you're in a concert, you're just going to hear noise. Contrary to Slater's claim, involvement in, in content is a prerequisite for experiencing immersion. Although specificities of the medium are crucial for understanding of the experiences they afford, we should avoid seeing such experiences as being determined by the qualities of technology. Of course, technology influences our initial uptake, how quickly we, we pick um, a particular system. Uh, the Kinect example is, is a good one, right? It's easier for a non-player to pick up uh, Kinect, something which is very, um, has a kind of uh, iconic relationship with, um, with, with the player, rather than using a completely abstract uh, control scheme, say, pressing a button and having my on-screen character do a twirl, right? It's easier to pick it up initially, maybe, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that I feel a sense of inhabiting the environment. Technological determinism tends to rise from seeing immersion, whether in the sense of absorption or that of environment habitation, as a single form of experience we can discover, measure objectively, and in so doing, engineer. In reality, the sense of inhabiting a virtual environment is, like the sense of inhabiting the physical world, made up of a variety of experiential phenomena, 
that are experienced on a continuum of attentional intensity rather than a binary on and off switch, present or not. So, as thorny as this issue might be, shuffling it under the carpet and claiming that the phenomenon does not exist is clearly not the way forward. Relegating the term to its pre-virtual environment status of general engagement, which is the most common approach to the issue, is equally unhelpful. My approach to the problem was to take a step back from the issue of immersion and first try to understand the precise nature of game involvement. If we want to further our understanding of virtual environment habitation, we first need to have a clearer understanding of its prerequisite, involvement. And involvement, like immersion, is not a single form of experience, but is made up of different facets thereof. We need, or I claim we need, a vocabulary to refer to these facets. Attempts so far at creating this distinction between forms of involvement have done so by attempting to distinguish between intensities of involvement using synonyms of the word to map out these differences. So we have models distinguishing between absorption and engagement, engagement and involvement, uh, engagement and immersion, and so on. My approach was to combine the wealth of research done on the subject in various disciplines, including literary theory, psychology, media studies, philosophy of mind, with qualitative research tools, including long interviews, focus groups, participant observation, and, and so on. This would form a framework that maps out the main dimensions of experience relevant to game involvement, resulting in what I prefer to, you, um, to uh, call the player involvement mod model. The interviews, focus groups, and participant research were all held in World of Warcraft and Planetside. So one is a, an MMORPG, the other one an MMORPS. So I'll, I'll give a bit of a description of the, of the model. Um, so the model is divided into three temporal phases and six dimensions. The temporal phases describe the intensity of involvement along a temporal continuum. The dimensions map out the different forms of involvement on each of the temporal phases. So, starting with the temporal phases, we have macro-involvement, which is the, the bigger um, um, hex here. And it describes the long-term motivations to engage with the game, essentially asking what keeps players coming back to the game. It also considers all forms of offline engagement with the game, both before and after actual gaming sessions. So we're talking about things like planning your strategy um, you know, in a, in a strategy game, discussing with friends uh, about the tactics of a uh, first-person shooter, whatever. All forms of engagement while not actually playing. The second um, hex, micro-involvement, um, describes the specific instance of gameplay, the moment-by-moment -moment involvement in the game. Now, following Orset's conception of ergodicity, I could have just as well called this ergodic involvement. And by this I mean um, that it takes into consideration the fact that the player is included and is an active participant in the cybernetic circuit with the game. This means that the dimensions of the involvement I'm going to describe soon um, are not really applicable or were not taught with non-ergodic media like film and literature in mind. Yes, some of the dimensions, let's say, like uh, narrative involvement, are also present in, in obviously in film and literature, but um, the form of engagement, because there's a the cybernetic feedback loop, is quite different. At least that's, that's the argument. The third and final temporal phase refers to the experience of habitation that terms like presence and immersion were created to, to describe. So, um, basically what I've been talking about before. For reasons I will outline at the end of the talk, I call this phase incorporation. It is worthwhile noting that unlike the previous two phases, incorporation is not afforded by every game environment to every player. It is thus not always present in every interaction with a game. But we'll talk about this a bit in more detail later. Each of these phases is made up of six dimensions. The six dimensions correspond to clusters of emphasis derived from analysis of the research data. The dimensions are not experienced in isolation, but always in relation to each other, the separation here being made for the sake of analysis. During gameplay, we tend to experience multiple dimensions simultaneously. The dimensions are kinesthetic involvement, spatial, shared, narrative, effective, and ludic involvement. And I'm gonna go 
um, briefly into each of these. Kinesthetic involvement. This deals with all forms of control and movement in the game. The potential for action is defined by the movement affordances designed into it. The player-controlled tank in Space Invaders can move left or right and shoot. There is no further potential for motion. Pac-Man moves in four directions on a 2D plane. On the other hand, Faith, the deft messenger in Mirror's Edge that we're seeing here, can walk, crouch, sprint, jump, and climb like there was no tomorrow. Movement creates the most intimate link between player and avatar. It is the key ingredient that enables acting upon the environment and is thus crucial to fostering a sense of agency. Aside from this, movement is also an enjoyable part of the experience, particularly when game controls are mastered, leading to more internalized or learnt kinesthetic involvement. As participants have noted, part of this pleasure is the ability to simulate experiences that are not possible in the physical world. Players get to experience the exhilaration of running up buildings or base jumping of a crane and knifing hapless soldiers ten stories below, as we're seeing in this uh, nice clip of another proud Battlefield 3 moment. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> and uh, whenever in-game movement was commented upon, participants described the sensation as if they were experiencing it themselves. There's a sense of assimilating the game world motion to the mostly inert physical body sitting in front of the PC or console. The sensation of movement can become even more intense when the dexterity of players is pressed to the limit, often by requiring multiple tasks to be performed simultaneously and at high speed, as we're seeing in this clip from Modern Warfare 2, where players have to divide their attention between maneuvering around opponents while avoiding trees and going down a steep slope at high speeds. At other times, the intensity of kinesthetic involvement is felt during those seconds or minutes of non-action, of anticipation, being ready to react to an on-screen cue and do so with precision and skill. An example of this is being shown here where I need to hit this, this guy who's pretty far off um, with, this, with the sniper rifle. Yet another proud battlefield moment. The depth of involvement is derived from timing and precise execution, and obviously rewarded with the satisfaction of success, or the frustration of failure, which both can be equally involving. And uh, here's a really quick side rant. Fun. So, <laughs> this, there is m more about this in, in the book itself, Shameless plug number two. But I'll just state here that the reason f why fun does not appear in the model is that it's largely immaterial to the gaming experience. But games are meant to be fun, you might say. Well, fun is a bit of an empty concept, at least analytically, that points generally to a positive experience without telling us what that positive experience is actually made up of. My argument is that games are first and foremost engaging. That is their main draw. And they can be incredibly engaging while being frustrating or not much fun at all. Back to the main thread. Oh, and you can lob rotten fruit at me for saying this later on. Um, ludic involvement. The ludic involvement dimension explores players' interaction with rules of the game and the series of possible choices that these afford. These interactions tend to be organized in terms of hierarchies of goals, which are either set by the game, established by the player, and or emerge from the player community within or outside of the gaming world. These goal structures often yield rewards for the player. They can result in improvements for the in-game character or the personal satisfaction of having achieved a self-stipulated um, goal. Seasoned players understand that well-balanced game systems emphasize the opportunity cost of any particular action taken. Without repercussions, actions lose their meaning and thus the emotional excitement generated by their execution. Whether the decisions made relate to ordering your troops on the battlefield in Napoleon Total War, what we're seeing here, creating a character in Mount and Blade, or planning the team's defensive strategy in Counter-Strike, say, Ludic involvement accounts for the considerations made to assess actions in a landscape of possibilities. And once again, those possibilities tend to be determined by the rules of the game, the uh, physical properties of the game environment, or the community. 
A powerful drive in games, which contain development of a character, race or nation, is this attraction to advancement that most players seem to have. Whether through increasing the character's attributes or the collection of desired items, there's this, there seems to be this universal draw uh, towards accumulation and improvement. Participants describe uh, how, how seeing scores increase and level meters filling up is engaging in and of itself. This is sometimes referred to as the number, numbers game. And this con concerns the attraction of seeing quantified accomplishments accumulate, often expressed in numerical formats. This is one of the more engaging aspects of level-based role-playing games and massively multiplayer games where missions or quests yield a certain number of experience points that go towards character advancement, also known as the I'll come to bed as soon as I level syndrome. Next up is effective involvement. The dimension describes the effective properties of games with particular reference to their aesthetic and mood-altering properties. The cognitive, emotional, and kinesthetic feedback loop that is formed between the game process and the player makes games particularly powerful means of affecting players' emotional states. For those suffering from a lack of excitement, games offer an immediate channel of emotional arousal. Conversely, for those whose work or personal lives are too hectic, the compelling nature of games make them ideal for shifting one's attention to performative tasks that suit the player's needs. The rhetorical strategies employed in the design of game environments are geared towards creating specific emotional responses. Of course, there's a discrepancy between the intended effects and those that are actually experienced by players. This discrepancy stems from a variety of sources, ranging from the individual's interest um, in a particular genre, previous experience with similar games, and other factors relating to one's lived experience and personal preference, or quite simply, um, not very effective design. My point is that designers cannot determine how a game affects the player precisely, but they do have a major role in establishing what mood the game aims to elicit. In both the kinesthetic and ludic involvement dimensions, we briefly touched upon the effect that affordances of control and rules have upon the player's mood. As a side note, I'd like to remind you that the, these dimensions are not meant to be viewed in isolation, but always in a combinatory fashion. Each moment of gameplay drawing upon multiple dimensions simultaneously and to different degrees. But aside from rules and action, a powerful means that games use to affect a player's emotional state are the quality and style of graphics and sound employed. Graphics are often the first aspect of a game to capture the player's attention, but when both when shopping for a new game and upon first playing it. It is no coincidence that major game reviewing sites, along with the publishers themselves, include links to screenshots and videos of gameplay. On some platforms, this trend has replaced the custom of issuing demos and thus allowing the players to have a taste of gameplay before purchasing the game, which was more um, the common practice in a decade ago, say. Attractive graphics can lure players towards games, but they don't guarantee long-term engagement. The latter tends to be carried on the back of other forms of involvement, such as the gameplay, stop that there, um, ludic and kinesthetic, social, the shared involvement, and the lore and story affordances of the game, narrative involvement. Nevertheless, attractive graphics and sound account for a magnificent part, for a significant part, sorry, of the attraction of certain games. A notable example was um, the shots we saw from Skyrim in there. But the participants sought a variety of experiences, ranging from the pleasures of aesthetically pleasing and peaceful places, like those described by some of the World of Warcraft players, to the darker and more fast-paced action horror games such as Fear, as we're seeing this grossy kind of scene we're seeing here. At times, players will sacrifice great gameplay for the chance to have experiences in specific settings they find appealing. A number of game designers are alarmed by the trend towards improving representation at the cost of innovative design, and there's no doubt that they are right from the perspective of creating interesting game systems. But we must not forget that digital games do not only attract players looking for interesting and cleverly designed systems, they also attract armies of players who want to live a particular experience, from being a Formula car driver, to a World War II sniper, the manager of a football team, or a sheep herder. Digital games are not only game systems, they are also digitally mediated experiences that address the desires generated by movies, literature, or free-ranging fantasy. 
I was a bit too fast and I missed my, my sheep herding video here, so I'm just gonna pause a bit. <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty proud of my sheep watching experiences in Minecraft. There she is. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> I have a pig herding video and a sheep herding video. I went with sheep for this one. Narrative involvement. Narrative in games has been the cause of much controversy, both in design and academic circles. When it comes to the experiential side of narrative, a distinction needs to be made between the narrative elements that have been pre-written into the game, what I refer to as scripted narrative, and the narrative that is generated in the player's mind through interaction with the game world and its inhabitants. I refer to this as alter biography. That is, our biography in an alternate space. Both these forms of narrative can play an important role in involving the player, but they do so in quite different ways. So what we're seeing here is an example of scripted narrative. This is a cutscene from Deus Ex 3, where quite towards the end of the game, that we cannot avoid. We need to get to a certain point in the game, and then trigger it. And we need to complete it and watch it in order to, to further progress. Once we get to this point, control is completely taken away from us, and we sit back and are fed the next section of narrative that has been pre-scripted, hence scripted narrative. In this case, the protagonist, Jensen, controlled by the player, finds Megan, his ex, who has been kidnapped um, and was thought dead. And a dramatic scene ensues. Oh. I've insulated your chip to prevent external signals from reaching it. It's something I developed recently using nanotechnology. Thank you, David. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Saraf here has asked me to show the world how human enhancement technology can change it. She can. After careful deliberation, I've decided I must do exactly that. Forgive me. Oh, why does everything have to turn into a zombie movie? So. The next clip gives us a nice example, and pretty simple one, of what I mean by autobiography. It takes place in our flat in the same world, the world of Deus Ex. I, di it, I did not have to come here, this is my flat, or take any of the actions. But following a harrowing jaunt in the sewers with some unsavory gang members, I figured it was time for a bit of a rest. So, I made my way home and spent some time relaxing and enjoying the lovely apartment. The actions you are seeing on screen make up the building blocks of what is to me an ongoing story which I have created. It is not free-roaming imagination, it's not just simply a fantasy about the game world, but a process of synthesis, as Iser calls it between the textual and mechanical aspects of the game and the player's mind. The two forms of narrative intertwine, one fueling interest in the other. Scripted narrative makes its way into autobiography through optional pre-scripted narrative chunks we can choose to tap into, such as the news broadcast on the TV we just saw and the emails we have in our inbox, or we can ignore. Confusions around game narrative tend to occur because of a lack of explicit differentiation between these two facets of narrative. Both are important and neither can fully define narrative in, in a game without reference to the other. So essentially what I'm saying here is that rather than taking classical conceptions of narrative and plugging them into a, games and, and saying, well, if this bit of the game does not fit a class, our classical notions of narrative, then it's not narrative, I'm basically asking for a redefinition of the notion of narrative that takes games and their specificities into consideration. But that's a different rant, again. Shared involvement. This covers all aspects related to the cohabitation of a common environment, ranging from collaboration to competition or the mere presence of others. An important characteristic of digital games is their ability to place a player-controlled agent within the represented environment that is visible to others. This presence is made more compelling when other agents respond to the player, whether these agents are human or computer controlled. Of course, human players tend to create a more exciting form of competition and collaboration because of their um, yeah, slightly better intelligence, I suppose. Um, <laughs> so this is um, particularly relevant in the case of single avatar games. And as it anchors players firmly in the location, both spatially and socially, so 
not only does the system realize that I am here in this point, but also other players. And that validates my location here, socially. Collaboration and competition with others is a key element of multiplayer games on and offline. Um, so here's a, I guess I'll let it draw. So this is an example from Portal 2, where I'm playing with my friend Pippin, who's that robot over there. And the idea is that we need to get to the exit here. And to do so, we need to um, each need to stand on these. There's a red button here and another one behind the wall to the left. The game works like this. We can, both, we can each shoot two portals. One is an entry portal. The other one is an exit portal. You exit the portal at the speed that you enter um, the first one. So we are basically creating portals for each other in order to navigate through this essentially what's a, a, a spatial puzzle, in order to get a ball that drops onto um, the ground um, that can be placed on that uh, shape over there and opens the exit for us. Um, so obviously, in order for us to progress in the game, we need to work together um, and solve the puzzle together. The second form of collaboration uh, we'll look at is on a much larger scale. This is planet side. Um, just to give you a quick context of what's happening, the game is a massively multiplayer online first person shooter, which basically means a first person shooter with lots and lots of people and persistent worlds and characters. So what we have is uh, one of the factions um, that is going to do a strike on another faction. There's a battle already ongoing, but we're kind of losing it. So our commanders are urging us to um, uh, collect at, at our base uh, and do one sort of concerted attack. In order to do this, um, we need to combine these elements. We have troop transporters, which are these things here. Those need a pilot and three gunners. The pilot needs to have the skill to fly the things, which is not easy. Um, and the character of that player has to have the in-game skill in order to be able to fly the thing. Then each of these co uh, contains a squad of 10 players, which have to be um, of different, um, they have different proficiencies, a medic, at least an engineer, a sniper, and a bunch of line soldiers. Um, these are fighters protecting the transports. They each carry one person. Um, then there's uh, bombers that, that help um, knock out ground defenses. That's three players each, again, with the relevant skills. And these are vehicle transports, which carry up to four vehicles, each of which holds two to three people. And all these have to have um, their own uh, in-game certifications and the skill to run these particular uh, types of plays. So just to give you a context of the complexity of, of uh, mounting this attack. Now, um, so this is about 150 players here, um, joining about another 150 on one continent among many. So this is one, one fight. And um, my role right now is as a, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm the leader of these three squads. I can communicate to any of the squad leaders, but not the players. The squad leaders can com communicate only to the players in their squad and to me. And I can communicate to the squad leaders and our commanders, which are in some spaceship somewhere, um, coordinating the, the battle over various continents. So we're talking a lot of, there's no AI in this game, or quests or anything, it's just players fighting players. Um, again, just to give a sense of this kind of complexity. So as we're seeing, this collaboration can range from a two-player puzzle game to a 300-player planetary invasion and planet side. Participants have stated that the possibility of working with other geographically distant people to reach a common goal is a strong attractor in online games. This element of shared involvement seems to be more intense the more people are working together. Of course, more things can go wrong, but when the collaboration works, the efforts are seen as being more than worthwhile. When participants were asked to relate memorable sessions of, of um, games, a large percentage described situations of successful mass collaboration and large battles. The presence of a large amount of players in each persistent world also seemed to underlie the sense that players felt like they were part of a living world. Of course, this is held by the fact that the worlds are persistent. Meaning, when you turn off your, your game, the world is still there, and, and other players are still in it. 
Spatial involvement. Spatial involvement is related to cognitively mapping one's immediate surroundings as well as exploring and navigating the larger area of the game world. Games often require players to internalize the spatial layout of the environment. A great example is, is coming up here, where we're going to see a player in Counter-Strike rushing into a corridor, getting blinded by a, by a flash grenade, and then finding a safe spot blindly in this level, because they have internalized, they know the space layout so much. So he runs in, uh, realizes there's lots of enemies, gets blinded, and runs to the left down the stairs, and is ready to continue the engagement. This mental mapping of a traversable game space works on various scales ranging from locating oneself in the immediately visible area to identifying one's location vis-a-vis -vis the larger world. This is often done with the assistance of in-game maps or directions from other players. The transition between the indexical map and the 3D environment surrounding the player involves a distinction between inhabiting the environment and a more detached disposition which helps when it comes to learning the geography of the game world, what Don referred to as reading the, uh, the map. The increased knowledge of the world makes it feel more familiar and easily navigable. The size of the world gives players a greater geographical scope. The sensation that beyond those mountains there, there are further lands to be explored. This creates a sense of grandeur and helps make the world a more believable, habitable place than simply a chain of environments linked together. As new environments are mapped mental, mentally, the player internalizes their layouts, thus requiring less investment of conscious attention to orienting oneself. The process of internalization involved in learning the layout of the map, region, or world gives a stronger sense of inhabiting the game space, or, to put it differently, for the game space to feel as though it were part of the player's immediate surroundings. So, that was involvement, or how I kind of structure uh, my thoughts around involvement. Getting back to the issue of immersion now. A game environments, as we said, afford experiences of a different nature to those enabled by non-ergodic medium. One of these phenomena is the potential to inhabit virtual spaces, not just in the confines of our own imagination, but also through the cybernetic circuit between player and machine. This experience has been described by the metaphors of presence and immersion. But as I argued earlier, these two terms are steeped in terminological and conceptual challenges. Along with these challenges, presence and immersion are further limited by describing the experience in terms of a unidirectional plunge into a virtual world. This creates a divide between the experience of the physical and virtual space. Presence is often described as, as the sensation of being there. One is either here or there. This exclusion of the external world, this submergence into the virtual other, is conceptually problematic. The player or participant is not merely a subject, subjective consciousness being poured into the containing vessel of the game. Our, our awareness of the game world, much like our awareness of our everyday surroundings, is better understood as an absorption into consciousness of external stimuli that are organized according to existing experiential gestalts, as theorists like Lakoff, Johnson, and Damasio, among others, have argued. If we feel like we exist in the game world at all, it is because the metaphor of habitation it provides is of a sufficient fit with the experiential gestalts that inform being in everyday life. A metaphor of virtual world habitation, therefore, should be compatible and continuous with our consciousness of the everyday, while taking into consideration the limitations and affordances of the specific and situated technological mediation. The metaphors of immersion and presence, founded as they are on an exclusionary logic, do not enable such a perspective. I therefore propose a fresh metaphor to account for the phenomenon, incorporation. So I'm borrowing an existing term here and, and trying to recruit or shape it um, to account for this sort of different way of looking at the phenomenon. Incorporation accounts for the sense of virtual environment habitation in two simultaneous levels, so there are two con necessary conditions for experiencing this, this phenomenon. First, the virtual environment is incorporated into the player's mind as part of their immediate surroundings, within which they can navigate and interact. Second, the player is incorporated in the sense of being re-embodied in a single, systemically upheld location in the virtual environment. 
Incorporation thus operates on a double ax axis. The player incorporates in the sense of assimilating or internalizing the game environment, while simultaneously being incorporated through the avatar into that environment. And again, the simultaneous occurrence of these two conditions is needed for one to experience what I'm calling incorporation. So I'm trying to basically weed out a lot of, of the, the vagueness and confusion around immersion and presence by limiting what the exact experience that we refer to. This yields the cumbersome, yet more, hopefully, more precise definition. Incorporation is the absorption of a virtual environment into consciousness, yielding a sense of habitation, which is supported by the systemically upheld embodiment of the player in a single location represented by the avatar. Yeah, put that on your t-shirt. <laughs> it's not exactly sexy, but you know, it's a bit more accurate, I think. And here I'd like to quote one of my participants whose experience really nicely embodies the notion of, of my reappropriation of the term incorporation. I don't remember the name of the location, but there was a time when I was playing through Guild Wars. It was in the war-torn parts of Ascalon. I was working through some ruins and I turned this corner and came across this massive ruined cathedral with this gorgeous stained glass window that was mostly intact. I just stopped and stared at it. I worked my way around it as much as I could to see it from all angles and ended up on a rise a little above it, just watching it. I don't remember the time of day, but it might have been a sunset and I swore I could practically feel the breeze on my face and hear the wildlife. If I could pay to experience that in real life, I would, and I would pay a lot. It was a real moment for me, a real experience that I carry with me, not as great as, say, seeing the pyramids, but pretty damn great. <laughs> a bit of emphasis there. <laughs> a few points to clarify. Incorporation is not an imagining. The habitation of the environment requires recognition from the system. This means that imagining ourselves in a book or movie scene does not satisfy the conditions for incorporation. Incorporation does not make for a better or worse experience of a game, but one of many. It is plotted on the model as the innermost hex because it represents the blending together of various forms of internalized dimensions of involvement. The more conscious attention is needed to, to tend to one dimension, the fewer dimensions can be attended to simultaneously since we have a finite amount of attentional resources. And the further one is from incorporation. For example, if I need to look up my keys while I'm playing a first-person shooter, because I'm still learning um, the keys of this particular game, then I have this distanced, right, more critical view uh, of the game, and I am not uh, inhabiting the environment. I'm attending to the controls. Finally, incorporation is not afforded by all games, and this is fine. While the macro and micro phases of the player involvement model apply to all game environments, incorporation does not. Well, every game embodies the player in a single location that the environment reacts to. If I command a nation or an army, I may imagine I am on the ground with my people, but the system does not recognize it, and the game does not encourage me to feel a sense of habitation. Thus, not all games afford incorporation. Conversely, not every game that affords incorporation is going to determine it for its players. Incorporation is a fleeting state that we move in and out of fluidly, depending on which dimensions of involvement we tap into, and the degree of internalization of each. And these blendings and shifts are constant and very fluid. Metaphors are never neutral placeholders of signifieds. They, act they actively shape our understanding of experiences and artifacts being studied. The aim of replacing the metaphor of immersion or presence is not intended to split hairs or increase confusion, but to build a better understanding of the experiential phenomenon this term was going to represent. With the increasing complexity of media objects that enable such experiences and the sophistication of scholarship around them, more complete accounts of the interaction between players and virtual environments are needed. The aim of this model is just that, to take us a step further down the road of discovery of our relationship with the digital worlds we are creating. And before I conclude, shameless plug number three, the book. Thank you. We, yes, it works. Uh, we do have some time for questions. Uh, Andres was first, then 
Dominic, then Patrick. Okay. Yeah, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, the fact that you, s you seem to speak of this as a game-specific phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, makes me think that it has a close relationship to flow, maybe. Can you, does it? Can you yes. explain the re relation? Yes, and again, in the book, shameless plug number four, I talk more about the flow and the relationship with incorporation. Now, um, the, first of all, the model is usable for pretty much any envi virtual environment, right? So it's more usable for, say, um, a serious game deployed in a virtual environment than it is for a 2D game. So it's not gamey per se. Um, the only dimension of the, uh, the, the model that is more game is maybe the ludic involvement. But anyway, the, um, with regards to flow, flow represents, um, describes our engagement with, with a particular activity. It does not comment on our relationship to space. That's not why it was created or intended to be done. So when I feel flow in a fencing match, right, I lose um, consciousness of my surroundings. My focus is on um, transferring consciousness from here to my point and getting that on target. And my relationship with my opponent, right? There isn't, there isn't a commentary there on space. Now, incorporation or immersion or presence, are, the emphasis there is on both movement, of course, in space, and also space. And we learn um, space by moving within it, of course. But the emphasis is on space, and flow doesn't comment on space. So the difference, I would suppose, is there. So I would say um, flow figures in the kinesthetic involvement dimension. So it's about um, action and control, um, but doesn't comment as much about space. It's more focused. Could we say that flow is a necessary condition for incorporation, or...? Or not? Yeah, the similarities are that the, the, the seven characteristics of flow um, all, are all based on internalizing the, the actions, right? Which is exactly what I, what I am arguing here as well, that um, the different dimensions get blended together. If we, have, we don't have enough attention and resources to, to, to focus on each of these dimensions um, fully, we need to, be, to learn them and, and internalize them in order to, to feel. So yes, it is uh, a prerequisite, I would say. Thanks. Um, thanks for this uh, presentation. Um, in your research on the uh, types and models of immersion, have you come across the SCI model by Franz Myra and uh, Irma Lowry? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, shameless plug number five. I myself wrote a paper mm -hmm. based on this model uh, in which I offered a few tweaks. but. Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, my question is, why did you felt the need to um, base your model on um, um, uh, surveys or, or, or questionnaires or whatever that you had people fill out? Mm -hmm. And don't you think that doing it this way introduces a, um, a miss... Um, uh, uh, I feel like it's conceptually a little unsound. Your, your, mm -hmm. your categorization because, uh, for instance, uh, spatial uh, uh, involvement mm -hmm. can be felt in a fictional sense, in a sensorial sense, and in a systemic sense as well. Uh, uh, for instance, you can be here between the rock and the tree, which is sensory, or you can be here on the continent of Tamriel in the province of Cyrodiil, which is more fictional, or you can be here between a cover spot and a place where enemies spawn, which is a systemic relationship to, mm -hmm. to space. So having uh, the fact that there is narrative engagement and ludic engagement and then spatial engagement, but in fact spatial engagement can itself be uh, a process of both of the other types of engagements. Yeah. And kind of. So uh, what was the reason for going with the empirical uh, mm -hmm. thing and what don't, do you think it produces a specifically... Um, a sp okay, yeah. All right. Um, to essentially two questions, so I'll, I'll go. I'll start with the, um, the, the, your distinctions between different kind of space. Spot on. I mean, there are these different relationships to space um, that, again, in, in, in the book, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep topping that plug, um, I go into all these different ones. Between the, and like I said, I, I, it's really difficult to talk about experience or, or create um, a terminology 
without making some separations, without creating some artificial um, lines. And yes, um, as I describe in the book, like where any kind of decision that we make is going to have to be enacted. So um, ludic involvement, which relates to, um, to, to planning and goals, is going to have to be made manifest in the movement, in kinesthetic involvement. And one moving, we move in space. So, that, so they're combined, obviously. And that's you know, what I, I wanted to emphasize. So I don't see that as being conceptually unsound um, as, as long as we, you know, I am accounting for all those things somewhere or other, which I am. Um, with regards to the, uh, that's a really good question about the um, empirical research. It was not initially the trajectory I was taking, coming from a humanities background, a humanities department. Um, I was basing it more on theory initially, but then felt I was really informing what I was writing based on my own experiences, since I had so many of them. So I figured it makes sense to listen to other players' experiences. And if I hadn't, I would have missed out on a couple of, of quite a few of these, these areas, which to me maybe weren't as important. Um, and what I did is I went for long interviews, so I, I amassed a lot of text and very open-ended kind of questions to, to just amass um, you know, a volume of, of stories, of accounts, and then sift through that as if it was a, if I was, as if I was analyzing a text initially, maybe because I'm, again, from a literary background. But, but why, why two uh, massively online games? Okay, recording? great, again. So there is a finite amount of games I can look into, right? And so I figured, all right, let me take something which is a game which is quite broad. Um, and I started with World of Warcraft. So all right, World of Warcraft includes um, lots of gameplay found in a lot of different other games, right? There's, um, there's a strategic element, there's a competitive element, collaborative element, there's the exploration. So I find them being quite good. If we have to choose a few cases, ideally, what I would have done is taken a few games from each, genre, each main genre and interviewed 50, 10 to 15 players on each. But to do that, I would have needed a team of, of research assistants, which I didn't have, as this was a PhD project, initially. Um, so MMORPG collects the, a certain set of, of um, uh, affordances of games that are found in various genres, like RPGs, puzzle games, whatever, action games. And then I wanted something which is also quite encompassing, but very different from World of Warcraft to contrast it to. And I couldn't think of anything more distinct than Planetside, right? Which is non-level based, non-class based, um, completely open-ended, no AI, no quests. And that encompasses the other, the Twitch gamers, right? And I, I stuck to those. Um, I'm missing out on the um, RTSs, for example, or turn-based strategy games. And the hunch there was, well, since my initial um, interest was in, in, in habitation, I figured strategy games won't, don't afford as much of that sense, so I'm gonna go with these two. And uh, hopefully future, in future research, I'll manage to, I'm working with um, uh, Carolyn Pulse on turning this into a, um, a quantitative measure so that we can deploy it to, to more game genres a bit easier. Yeah. I just, just wanted to ask you a bit, apropos that last question as well, Do you, would you consider it an absolute condition um, or, uh, that there is a for incorporation, as you understand it, a very high degree, a relatively high degree of photorealism, uh, the presence of an avatar, mm -hmm. and um, also simulated movement within the game space? as conditions for this incorporation, because uh, honestly, I don't really play a lot, <laughs> a lot of multiplayer games or anything mm -hmm. like that, but I play a lot of solitaire, mm -hmm. uh, especially, uh, especially uh, free cell. I think it's very, I enjoy that. I, I, I mean, I feel that I'm uh, fairly immersed in it, fairly incorporated in it, because I feel a feeling of success and et cetera when they do something fast. So, um, just is photorealism really important, or is it more something that could also be applied to games that, that, that are less? Uh... Okay, so I would say that a so similar question that I'm often asked is why I, I do talk about Connect and we and so on, but don't, why don't I stress that these are, um, for other people, these are more obvious ways of being present in the environment, right? Being, um, I, 
quite disagree there because they have some affordances, but they have a lot of limitations. So in Connect games, we don't explore much of an environment because you know, there isn't that modality of running or... Um, the difference is on the update. The difference is players tend to need to sit with it a bit longer for their imagine. It does less work and your imagination needs to do more. Sartre describes this as, as synthetic projection. When you have a prop and you, you, you um, dress it with your imagination and become something else. So there's more effort from the player's side. It takes a bit more time, it takes some getting used to. Um, but then it tends to be probably even more rewarding, right? Because you're investing more, you're turning it. There's less jarring elements because you're um, uh, plugging holes of inconsistency with your imagination. Um, so, so that's on, on, on that side. I don't, however, uh, see that so games like Solitaire or Free Cell, I want to exclude them from this idea of... I think you can be very involved and their different elements of the model might be useful, but n I want to leave that out from the sense of inhabiting the game space. Where are you in, in, in Free Cell? You're not, you, you have no embodiment in that space. I'm the player. But you, you, are, you have no representation in that, in that space, right? You can see the movements Where are you in the space? Exactly, you're not, we're not I'm within that space. I'm just, well, I'm deciding where they're going to move in the space. And they obey. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly the kind of thing that I... That, so that's, I, I disagree with you having a location in that, in, in that environment. Right? That's quite a different... It's still engagement. You are there, you're affecting the world, of course. But it's a very different experience, I feel, from what you saw with my running around and jumping off cranes. Yeah, no. Yes, satisfaction relates to involvement, not incorporation. Right? I'm trying to separate these two things. Right? So um, these two senses of immersion, immersion as being very absorbed by, um, and immersion as being in an environment. Okay, I have a question myself, or here. Okay. <laughs> uh, would you link uh, immersion or incorporation with, link, with a skill, with the player's skill? And if so, how? Okay. Um, Remember when I said that in order to feel incorporation, one needs to... Um, I didn't speak about this in the talk, but initially the idea also of the hex, this is probably just something that I will, only I will ever <laughs> get, but each triangle um, that represents each um, type of involvement starts off from the top being our maximum attention resources. We devote all our attention to, say, movement or control, mm -hmm. right? To the, f the more you learn, and that particular um, aspect of involvement, the further down the, the, the thing you go, and that's why incorporation is located here at, at the blending of these things. It's pretty crude and arbitrary. So, yes, learning um, so it has a, a, a big part to do with it because unless you learn um, controls or unless you get used to the environment, you're going to keep, let's say, space, right? If we don't, if we keep getting lost, I keep switching to the map, I am constantly out of that environment. Right? If I don't, um, if you watch new players um, try to navigate a, a, a 3D maze, they'll keep, you know, for example, in Counter Strike, I ran some experiments in Counter Strike, there's these double doors that are kind of like this one's closed, one's ajar, and you see new players just keep going back and forth, back, left and right, left and right, and don't manage to get through the gap. And to me, it's like, what, what, just, just go through. And of course, then there's a just frustration with, you know, just getting through the door, you're not in the environment, you, you're very much at a distance. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's not for the numbers, uh, but I think we should break for lunch and yeah. take the, uh, the discussion during the lunch break. We must be hungry for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, like, and we have to be out of this place at 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys.